Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. We have a returning guest today to Postcards from a Dying World. Uh, Lisa Morton joined us on our insanely long, almost three hour epic top 20 Hong Kong films panel uh, with Jeff Briggs and Joey O'Brien and myself. Uh, So if you're a Hong Kong film nerd, uh, you cannot do better than three hours of us breaking down Hong Kong movies. Um, and uh, just on that note, uh, I just want to put a shout out in the world to Jimmy Wang Yu, who just recently passed away, who's one of the greatest stars of Hong Kong cinema. Um, so an RIP out there. But Lisa is here today to talk. To- Listen, there is so much we could talk to Lisa Morton about. Lisa is... Um, uh, a novelist four times over. She's written over 150 short stories. She's been nominated for the Bram Stoker Award six times. She's an expert on Halloween and all things weird, strange, and scary. Uh, Lisa, welcome to Postcards from a Dying World to talk about yourself, which is super fun for me. (laughs) Oh, me too. Thanks. It's fun to be back. Yeah, um, last time we just talked Hong Kong movies, and everyone should know that you are uh, a reservoir of knowledge of Hong Kong movies, and our mutual, uh, one of our favorite directors, Troy Hark, and so people should really check that out, because it is really cool. You'll get all kinds of great movie recommendations from that. But let's talk about your horror origin story. Um, and, and another thing, too, I should mention that you have, like, one of the coolest day jobs because just the one day I spent poking around at the Iliad bookstore in L.A., I was just, like, I just wanted to absorb all the energy of those books. So that was really cool. Yeah, um, I'm very, very fortunate to have that job. I, I've been there almost 30 years, and I love it. Yeah, uh, what a bookstore. So the Iliad in L.A., um the big shout out to your store where i came home with the stack of paperbacks um really love it there um but your horror origin story how did you get into horror and um uh eventually wanting to to write it yourself i always loved it um when i was really tiny i loved it uh i always describe myself as that weird little girl wanted to be a monster instead of a princess at halloween um, and my parents were very indulgent. They re- actually really enjoyed horror as well. My dad and I would make Aurora monster models together. And my mom and I would stay up late and watch whatever weird, obscure horror movie they were running um, back in the day when we only had like five channels on the television. And um, so I just always loved it. And then it, when I was 15, they released this movie called The Exorcist. And that was like a massive brain bomb for me. Um, it's, it's hard to describe now what kind of effect that movie had on an audience back in the day. It was incredible. And it's funny because just the other day I saw some article making fun of the idea that, oh, yeah, they want us to believe people were fainting and passing out and vomiting during this. No, really, people were fainting and vomiting and screaming and running during that movie. And when I saw that in a theater happening around me, it was like, okay, I want to have that kind of effect on people. And and that kind of right there was that's it. I got it. I got to write this stuff. Did you guys have a horror host in L.A. Um, at the time? You must have, right? Oh, yeah. We had a couple. We had, in the 70s, we had um, uh, Seymour, who was really fun. This this uh, sort of cadaverous-looking guy with a really dry sense of humor who was fun. And then, of course, in the a-, a little later, we got Elvira. Oh, yeah. Elvira would have been local for you guys, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, you're lucky you. Yeah, see, so we had Sammy Terry in Indiana, and he was he was like, almost all horror nerds in Indiana 
have their you know can trace it back to to sammy terry but um but i do think too like those communal experiences of like how the horror movies affected people i think people are more jaded these days anyways because and, and a lot of these young people who like can't imagine sitting through a movie without looking at their phone every once in a while don't don't, don't understand the impact that well even for example jaws had you know a, a huge people were massively affected by that and I'm not even a huge Jaws fan, but I, I know some people will throw stuff at me, but but that movie had a huge impact as well. I mean, that's really the movie that started Blockbusters. But being in L.A., um, you must also have a unique relationship with horror because a lot of it was being created in your city, right? So that's a different experience for some of us too, right? So you had a lot closer... Um, connection to where a lot of it was being made between just the writers too you know yeah but that came later for me I, as a kid i was growing up in um way out in the suburbs in the san gabriel valley arcadia and pasadena and, and we were pretty far removed from anything to do with hollywood so um we didn't i i don't know that i was even as a really small kid was even gigantically aware of it happening anywhere near me i just you know, watched it on the television and made monster models and doodled on my devils in my notebooks at school. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk about L.A. some, too, because I think L.A. plays a role in your fiction much the way uh, Maine d d did for Stephen King or East Texas for Joe Lansdale. So um, and, and it's one of the things that I, I really appreciate a, a, about your fiction is, is how L.A. it, it is. Um, because LA doesn't have to just be like Chandler Noir, you know, stories, right? Or um, or just Hollywood stories. It's it's good to see like some uh, scary stuff about LA uh, because I I think that obviously there's a lot of that there. Um, so, but growing up in in Southern California and being around this, like you know, you said that a, a lot of that was later, but I do think that you know just um, you know, you're a movie town, right? So being able to see movies, I'm sure there were more revival movies. And if your parents were into it, you were probably able to go see those things and, and do those things. And so that's, I, I'm, I'm imagining that was, that was just a fun place to grow up. You know, my, my parents were not big like theater goers. Um, I mean, they loved to watch things on television. We didn't go to a lot of movies in theaters when I was a kid, but one thing I have become aware of later in life that I'm sure had some sort of impact on me getting into horror later on was my dad was a hunter and he was obsessed with hunting and fishing. I mean, to the kind of thing where just before he died back in 2015, you would talk to him and all he'd want to talk about was, yeah, that deer I bagged in 68 or whatever. And then you'd find out he had done these amazing things in his job. He was this engineer who designed like space helmets for NASA for the Mercury program and just incredible things. But he wasn't interested in that stuff. He wanted to, all he wanted to do was hunt and fish. And when I was a kid, I would periodically like during deer season in October, I'd get dragged out of school for a week and hauled up to someplace like Montana or Idaho, where I would sit in a freezing cold camper with my mom while dad was out getting his deer. And then, you know, he'd be gone for a couple of days and come back with this thing that he'd carve up right outside the door of the camper. So it was a really strange upbringing in some respects. And, and it's Were you things. reading a lot during those trips? Yeah, or? I was. I was reading a lot. I was, we had a little tradition where we would stop at whatever was like the last drugstore before going out into the boonies. And my mom would let me pick some things to, to read. And I would always get a couple of paperbacks and, and they'd often have like a famous monsters of film land magazine. And I'd get one of those. And I mean, I read those things to shreds in the camper things. And um, so now it's all making sense to me because yeah. <laughs> it, you know, I think one of the secret tools that you find when, when, at least for me, when you start talking to, any kind of writer who's had real success in this this business, if you're talking to your Laird Barons or your uh, Brian Evansons or your Lisa Mortons, right? 
you you get this part of their origin story where they're like, oh yeah, I had a lot of time on my hands and I did a lot of reading. And you always hear some some version of that. I did a lot of reading and it's the people who who really love to read and you can also see signs of that like for example like when you talk to people and you're like and you mention obscure books and they've they've read them you know <laughs> and uh so i think part of your origin story is all that reading right and so oh, yeah yeah so, so who were who were the ones when you were young who were the writers that really lit you up when you were a teenager or just or, or on these trips? Who were your favorites? Um, if we're talking like even pre-adolescent, I, I loved Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. Um, it wasn't until later that I kind of discovered more of the horror guys in my teens, of course, Poe and Stoker. But then I had a, I had a really cool cousin who lived in Indiana who was a librarian and one Christmas she sent me a little box paperback set of Lovecraft and um, that stuff kind of blew my mind. I think I was probably like 13, 14 when I read that. Um, so oh, wow, it, what a cool package. It was yeah. really great. Yeah, I, I'm, I wish I still had that little box set. I don't know whatever happened to that, but um, yeah, it, uh, it, that was a big thing. Um, and then of course, later on, um, finding the people like Stephen King and, and um, uh, uh, William Peter Blatty, obviously. I read The Exorcist before I saw the movie. Um, Thomas Tryon with the other. A lot of those sort of influential 70s books I was reading as a teenager. Now, I bet that was formative. If you'd read The Exorcist before you went into the theater and saw people having that reaction, you already knew the story. You already knew, and because it was a very faithful film, like adapted by the the novelist. I mean, pretty faithful. You must that must have been like really showing because I, I I often when I interview authors talk about the story where you first had the light bulb moment that like this story taught you how to tell horror. Was that? experience of having read the exorcist and seeing everyone's reactions in the theater that must have had an impact i'm sure yeah right? it was it was gigantic and as much as i liked the book it was really the film that had that impact on, on me just because i think of that visceral reaction of the audience around you which of course you didn't quite get in the book but i remember being 14 and reading the book and i was like the star kid at school that year because my mom let me read the exorcist which the other <laughs> kids like their parents wouldn't let them read it so they were all coming up to me oh what what happens what happens that's cool that's really cool and um so so let's talk about before we get we'll get more into to your influences when we talk about night terrors because i think i think that plays obviously it always plays a role when, when you're talking to writers but let's talk about a few other projects you have going on because one of the cool things is is that and i don't know where you have all the time to do all this stuff um but you know, you're working on many different kind of projects um, and have become an expert uh, just in, uh, you know, the field of talking about the history and the culture surrounding Halloween. And um, how, did, how did you kind of position yourself as that? I mean, we're horror writers. We all love Halloween. Halloween's like really important to us. But but Lisa, you've become very serious about Halloween. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, I have, but I never intended that. That was almost an accidental expertise that I acquired. Um, way back in, at the uh, beginning of the 2000s, um, I had just done the Choi Hawk book. Um, and I did that for a publisher called McFarland. And, and after finishing that book, um, they said to me, hey, do you want to do another book with us? And I looked at a current catalog they had of things they were bringing out, and one of them was called the Christmas Encyclopedia. And I said, hey, I, I don't think anyone's ever done a Halloween encyclopedia. What do you guys think of that? And I put together a little proposal, and they said, we love this. Let's do it. And um, it was, of course, insanely difficult putting together an entire encyclopedia. It was a couple of years of research in the days before everything was digitized and online. Um, I had, at the time, I had my own small reference library. I had a couple of fun old Halloween books that had come through the Iliad, and um, 
So uh, those were my sort of first line on that. But then I ended up uh, becoming a regular <laughs> attendee of the uh, downtown public library in LA, which fortunately is one of the best in the country. It's really good. And this was, again, this was back in the day when you were digging through old newspaper articles on microfiche. And uh, the librarians were fantastic and would help me find incredible things. And by the time I was done putting together that encyclopedia, I had amassed so much material that it was easy to, to just roll it over into other books. And um, the next one I did was, was a collection of those original source materials. And then um, around what, around 2010, I think it was, I um, got the invite to write Trick or Treat, a history of Halloween for a British company called Reaction Books. And what was funny about that was I'm a huge fan of their books. I love reaction books, which are always these really nicely laid out little books with great text and, and photos, quite often color photos, even in the paperback editions and stuff. And they, they contacted me out of the blue one day and said, hey, we're doing a line of books on the holidays. Would you like to do one on Halloween? And I actually thought it was a scam at first. I was like, okay, who's who is this? This is one of my friends hoaxing me. And then I realized, oh my God, this is legit. I love reaction. So I did Trick or Treat a History of Halloween for them. Um, and that was. You must. And it's another thing that you and I have in common. You must really love doing the research because yeah. <laughs> I love doing research. I love digging through things. I love like going to libraries and archives and finding like you know, stuff like, and for me, it's, uh, and, you know, I just did the Cal State Fullerton archive for another time recently, and I had the fun moment where the millennial intern was, like, looking at me, like, why are you so excited? And I'm like, this is the manuscript of Dune. Do you not understand how crazy this is? And it's, like, you work here every day. You're, this manuscript is in the room with you or on the, in the next room every day like how cool is that and they have no idea how cool it is so research you must love love to do research right yeah i totally do it's it's a treasure hunt isn't it i mean isn't yeah. it like you're digging, you're digging for gold and every once in a while you find one of those nuggets and it's just this huge thing and yeah so what's your favorite like crazy thing that you found doing research to do with just halloween like, what's your favorite, like, happening upon something at a library, for example? My, I think my favorite was the moment I discovered a guy named Charles Balancy, because I had always had a question of where did this bizarre notion come from that Halloween was somehow based on the worship of a Celtic lord of death called Samhain, and I mean, it was such nonsense and ran so counter to what Samhain means and what we know of the Celts. And, and that that whole thing has been used so much by people to justify why Halloween is evil and so forth. And I really wanted to find where did that come from? And I stumbled on the history of this guy named Charles Valency and I started digging into it and I found this is the guy who started that and when you suddenly realize that it's just like oh my god this is the exact moment in history when that fallacy started and this guy was uh, this valency 18th century british surveyor who was sent to ireland to survey ireland and he was there for something like 12 years and he was obsessed with celtic culture and celtic lore and language and he put together a massive six volume um, book set of all of his lore. But the problem is that he was a fool <laughs> and he was obsessed with trying to justify his bizarre ideas. And he just threw out all of the existing scholarship and made crap up. And I mean, at, even at the time, his own peers would call him, uh, what was the, something about the most misguided man in history or something. I mean, they said terrible things about him at the time. And yet those books found their way into libraries all over the world. And people went to those and drew some of their Halloween research from those and didn't bother to double check the sources and 
to, to read up on Valency, and that's where we get what I call that strange alternate history of Halloween. Oh, God, that's so fascinating. How did you end up writing a, a, a book about seances and more into the, because uh, you did a book called Calling the Spirits, right? Uh-huh. Which is, how did you get into that? Because that seems like a whole, a whole other thing, <laughs> like... Which is cool because I think you probably – have you been on Coast to Coast yet? Have you been able to do that kind of thing? Like, Yeah, I have, yeah. That's yeah, awesome. see, that's just – that's that's rad. Uh, and I'm <laughs> – um, that is – speaking of somebody who's like a long like, – who's worked overnights and done a lot of listening to Coast to Coast, even though I'm a fairly skeptical person myself, I listen to it anyways just because like even if I think a lot of it is, is hooey – I, I still just enjoy, especially back in the day when I think the, um, for George Nori, I think, you know, they took things. I like, if you're going to take, have anybody on, you got to take them seriously, right? At least yeah, for the yeah. time that you are. So how did you get into this whole, like, um, writing a book about a seance or seances? Because that's got to be a fascinating history too. And fun research. I'm sure. It was really fun research, but, um, uh, what the book there's actually a book that came in between the sands book and and trick-or-treating history of halloween and that was a book called ghost a haunted history mm. um which i did and i think that came out in 2015 and again reaction books and um they came to me with that one and they said we're doing a line of creature books would you like to do one and i said i'd love to and they actually gave me a list of creature things to choose from um and there were some things on the list. There were things already taken. I actually said right off the bat, I want to do zombies. And they said, sorry, that's already taken. Um, and then um, uh, the, in their list of things they wanted to do a book on was ghosts. And I said, well, I've always loved ghost stories. So let's, let's do ghosts. And so after doing a history of ghosts, which was both a... Um, a true history going all the way back to legends of Gilgamesh and so forth and around the world. Um, after doing that, they when they approached me and said, hey, now would you like to do a history of seances? That seemed fairly easy because, yes, I already had studied so much about ghosts and contacting the dead and so forth for the ghost book. Um, and it's funny that I am also a pretty skeptical person. When I started doing Ghost of Haunted History, I was even much more skeptical. But after compiling this massive history of it, and you look at look at all of the accounts throughout history, and you end up going, well, okay, there is something going on. I don't know what it is. I don't really know that I believe it's the spirits of the dead returning. I tend right. to think maybe it is a neurological phenomenon that some people are just wired differently and perceive things in a different way. Um, but it definitely writing the first ghost book definitely changed me a little bit in terms of my view. Well, I'm that. also a skeptic who believes that they lived at least once in a haunted house. So and okay. I don't know how to explain it necessarily, but um, right around the time that Carrie and I got married, we lived in a house in North Park that a woman had lived in for 50 years and then she passed away and then they cleaned up the, she had no, um, she had no family or anything and the city took over and we were living close by and we, we jumped on like when the city was, we saw the person working for the city and we said, Hey, we'd like to rent this house. So we were the first people to live in the house after she passed and they said she was a pack rat and that she had to you know and, and that she had 40 years of stuff in this house and they eventually the city knocked down the house and put apartments like four apartments on the space and one of the things of of us living there was is that we were trying very hard to convince people not to buy it Every time they would come and see the house and because they would have realtors and different people come by. And my feeling was, is that whatever spirit was there, this lady understood that we were protecting her house or we were trying because people would talk about it. And um, when we first moved in, we felt 
a very uncomfortable energy and I don't know how to explain it because I'm a skeptic and I don't, but then the longer we spent time trying to convince realtors not to buy it or people not to knock it down. We talked to the people who ran it for the city, like don't sell this property. It's amazing. Like that energy changed and we definitely felt it. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It's just a thing like, you know, mm -hmm that the energy changed all around the house is like we spent all this time trying to to what we consider defend the house and we eventually lost we lived there for a year and a half the city sold it out from under us we had to move and um but we had this you know and now every time i go by and i see the apartments that are there i just i get very frustrated like i've ridden by on my bike a couple times but anyways i'm sorry i'm i'm that's that's the only story that I have where I can say like I felt something, but you definitely felt like you got a new appreciation for things like doing that research. Yeah, I mean, and and stories like that, like the one you just told. Also, um, I mean, I did. I've also done some paranormal investigations, and I have been in places where a friend who who is literally shoulder to shoulder with me is experiencing something, and I'm not. Um, right which is one of the mysteries about ghost hunting. And, and one of the reasons that I've almost wondered if it has to do with the way some people are just wired differently to perceive things. And um, one of the, the, it's interesting that you're talking about feeling this, this energy, because that absolutely is something that paranormal investigators consider to be a real piece of evidence, the, that sense that some people get. And um, I have worked with, um, there's a lady named Bridget Marquardt, and I do a weekly guest spot on her podcast, which is about ghosts, and she always interviews interesting people in the paranormal world, and um, Bridget is a sensitive, and I have been with her when she would walk into a room, and suddenly, with her, it feels like a pressure. She says it's like she suddenly can't breathe. She feels a pressure or a weight. And she almost is always right. Whenever she walks into a place and says, oh, I feel it here, that's when the person who owns the house or the building or whatever walks up and goes, well, right there is where blah, blah, blah happened. Right, right. Yeah. Well, it's crazy, too, because that was my first experience where, especially as a skeptic, where if you had told me ahead of time, like, you're going to have this feeling living in this house, I would have been like, no. No, but after that experience, I've become more aware, or I think more about the, especially as somebody who's been a constant renter is like, whenever I moved into a new place, I always think about like wondering what happened in this place in the past and like, you know, what kind of ghosts of those moments are there. And anytime you go back to like a childhood home or something, if you get that opportunity, it's really fascinating to feel that a couple um like 15 years ago um my i had a cousin from minnesota where we where my parents grew up uh, who got married and my aunt and my cousins rented that house that my grandparents lived because they found it was for rent and they rented it for the summer so a bunch of us could stay at my grandparents house and they'd been had passed away, you know, two, two decades ago and no one, we hadn't been back and being back in my, and my mom and my aunt who are twins, their childhood bed bedroom, you know, was, was a intense feeling. It was a very intense feeling. And, and whether that's ghosts or just memories triggering it, you know, it's, it's a fascinating thing to think about. So I'm sure writing the seance book was super fun and like a really cool experience, just like, um, because I, I'm sure you got, that must've been fun research too. Like, um, do you have any like cool research stories for the seance book? I'm sure. Oh yeah. There, um, one of the great things about researching that book was there is a treasure trove of material at a website called IAPSOP.com. I forget exactly what it stands for. International Alliance for the Preservation of Spiritual and Occult Papers, maybe something like that. But this website, which is totally free to access, has scanned thousands of the original 19th century spiritualist papers. Um, wow. because they, they did newspapers right and left. All of the spiritualists in the 19th century 
communicated with each other. They on both sides of the Atlantic and both Britain and the U.S. There were spiritualist newspapers and magazines and books and pamphlets. And this website has an incredible collection of them. And they've digitized them all and made them available. And you can search and so forth. Reading those 19th century, the actual descriptions of seances from the people who were there participating in them at the time was really eye-opening. Um, yeah, they're not at all what we think of as the modern seance. Um, and I think our idea of a seance is now colored by so many horror movies yeah. that we don't realize these were not frightening events to the spiritualists in the 19th century. They were like one part revivalist meeting, one part magic show, one part party. Um, the people would usually start a seance by, I mean, they're all seated around the table. They've turned the gas lights down low and they start by singing and they will sing a couple of songs. They might have sung hymns or popular tunes at the time. And it, it created this sort of warm and convivial atmosphere. Although it served a second purpose, which I discovered, which was it also made enough noise that it covered the medium getting anything ready. Um, uh, yeah. The mediums, of course, were essentially all tricksters. Some of them were very, very good at what they did and um, very creative. Um, and the, uh, the things that would happen at the seances just generated this immense sense of wonder in many of the participants. And you read their accounts and, and it's things like, and then we watched an accordion float through the air while it played by itself. And um, and, and they'll end by saying it was a most wondrous night and it was one of the best nights of my life and that kind of thing. And so now, have, have, has a handbook for has anyone ever left any like um, how to like type things that these mediums used or like. That's a really good question because they supposedly existed and I haven't yet been able to firmly track down one, but um, I did find a really interesting 1937 book by a fairly well-known magician uh, named John Mulholland. And I'm trying to remember what the exact name of the book was, something like Beware the Medium or something like that. And Mulholland was a magician who had indeed cataloged many of the ways that the mediums duped people, as did Houdini with his 1924 book, A Magician Among the Spirits. But Mulholland actually did say there were catalogs and there were books that they used. And there were, he also claimed there were directories that the mediums would share that would list these sort of more gullible spiritualist in every city. And that if you were a medium, you could use that directory to go to a new city and make the acquaintance of somebody who you might be able to take for a fair amount of money. Now, here again, nobody ever has come up with one of these directories, but uh, Mulholland swore to, he swore that he had seen one at least. So they apparently did exist with that kind of thing. Um, and I have wondered, the, the mediums had some fairly serious equipment that they used to do people. They had things like telescoping rods that they would pull out in the darkness and put a, a phosphorescent covered ball on the end of it and fly that over people's heads. And um, I have wondered if there are catalogs of like magic shops where they purchase that material. And I'm sure that must exist somewhere. Like I said, I, I didn't, get to track one of those down unfortunately but <laughs> i would i would dearly love to see one. Oh man yeah that would be amazing mm -hmm. now one of the projects that you've worked on recently that i don't want to go too deep on because i i i want to devote a whole episode eventually to it and you know what i'm uh, about to ask you about because we've talked about this and i want um i have a plan for this but you did um a book on uh, weird women writers with Leslie Klinger, Klingerman, is it Klinger? Um, I'm sorry, Klinger. Klinger, yeah. I've met Leslie, <laughs> lovely guy. Um, uh, the, the idea here is to um, 
and this is the same kind of thing that um, Lisa Yazik did with The Future is Female, which showing how many voices there are in science fiction for women when a lot of times people think there's this idea that, that women were not writing science fiction back in the day or not writing weird fiction back in the day. And you guys, um, what was the genesis with this project? It was a book or a collection of some of the weird writers of the 19th century. Is, is that what is that what she did, did so far? Mainly 19th, although we do go into 20th. Um, Les and I had done a collection of classic ghost stories together and and um, we were thinking about trying to do another book and he was visiting with a friend who had a library somewhere back east, I think is the way it went. And she had a display of books that was labeled Weird Women. And he wrote me, I think like the next day and said, what about an anthology called Weird Women? And, and I loved it and, and we got right onto that. We sold it very quickly. Um, we have done two volumes of it. And the idea, yes, is that there were far more women writing horror and weird fiction in the 19th and uh, early 20th century than most people realize. Um, we wanted to bring some of these incredible stories they wrote to life and make people more aware of them. And um, I think one of my questions that has arisen out of this is why aren't these women better known? Why isn't um, for example, Mary Elizabeth Braddon as well known as M.R. James, because I really love her work. And I think part of the reason is that these women were often making their living as a writer. Many of them had um, husbands who had died young or uh, parents who had died young, and they turned to writing to make a living, which you could do then. And they wrote in all kinds of different genres. They didn't write exclusively for work, although uh, some of them actually did have collections that were exclusively horror. But I think that writing in so many different areas may actually have worked against them in the long run because people now, for example, think of Elizabeth Gaskell. For a long time, they thought of Elizabeth Gaskell, who was a gigantic, successful 19th century author, as the author of a book called North and South. And it hasn't been until recently that she has become recognized as the author of the first really great, great early ghost story. Um, well, not the first, but one of the first ones, which is uh, the old nurse's story. And um, so it's it's been a real pleasure to bring these women back into the limelight. Yeah, and um, I, it, like I said, I, I want to devote a whole episode to this, so I'm just kind of teasing everybody out there that um, pretty soon um, I, need, I want to read Weird Women first, and so it's on my list, and, um, you know, so I can bring more to the table in the interview <laughs> at that point. Um, also, I'm, um, and, and my, my intention is to team you up with, with the other Lisa, um, <laughs> because I think it's awesome that that two Lisas have done such similar work in, in, in two similar genres. Uh, and it cracks me up. Um, and uh, I think you guys will be amazing together. So I'm really excited to do that. Um, here's the thing. So you're do, doing a second volume. You've had to, that's more research. You've had to uncover authors that were lost, missing, you know, you, I mean, it's it's serious research to 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 rediscover, you know, to do re rediscovery work. It's 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 a tough field. It is, and and um, my favorite story about researching an author for one of these books was um, one of the things that Les and I did to find these wonderful women was read a lot of like critical histories of the genre and. Um, there was a name that came up in a couple of the things that we read, and the name was um, uh, Regina um, uh, Block was her name, and um, we kept, we couldn't find anything by this woman, and it turned out nothing had ever been digitized. She did two collections of stories in 1918 and 1919, and that was it, and then she kind of vanished, and um, uh, it, it 
nothing was digitized, nothing online, very, very scarce books. And it turned out that the University of Riverside Special Collection had both books in their collection. And so I made an appointment to see the books and I drove out there one day and I actually um, photographed both books completely. And we did use a story out of one of those books, The In Weird Women. Um, and you know, <laughs> I know that process of photographing yeah, there books. You go. <laughs> and then and for Les and I have a book coming out in August called um, Haunted Tales. And I found a story by a woman author in that that was incredible. I was digging around in correspondence of Charles Dickens because Dickens used so many interesting writers uh, to write ghost stories. He always put them in the Christmas editions of his magazines that he was editing. So I was digging around looking at the Christmas editions of the magazines and reading his correspondence and I found a letter that he wrote and I think it was 1855 that it was written to a friend of his and it said, I have just read the best ghost story ever written. And I was like, what is this? And it's a story that almost no one knows today. I dug, found this story. It is indeed absolutely stunning. And I'm really happy. It's by a woman named Dinah Mulock. Um, wow. She, yeah, this story will be in Haunted Tales, and I, it's one of those that you can't wait for people to read because people are going to go, holy crap, this is from 1855. It feels very relevant. It's got a definite feminist edge. It's about a woman who has been raised by a very, very controlling guardian, male guardian, and um, a lot of women will read it and go, oh my god, I know this toxic masculinity here, and um, it's really great. And it has a very interesting spin on ghost too, which is, I won't give it away right now, but it, it kind of flips a few of the tropes. And again, you're like, I can't believe this was done in 1855. So. And you just found that because Dickens mentioned it in a letter, right? Dickens that is mentioned so cool. it, I tracked it down. And then uh, even on top of that, I found out that when the author reprinted it in her collection two years later, she changed it a little bit. She actually changed the title um and changed a few bits of the writing and so i kind of went back and forth on which version we should use to reprint from and we ended up going with her revised version which has a better title dickens just called it called it a ghost story right. um, but she she called it m anastasius which is the name of the guardian figure mm. so um we used her slightly rewritten version of it um from 1857 yeah i love when you have those discovered we found um a house that philip k dick lived in that none of the philip k dick scholars knew because two weeks before my berkeley trip um another um a podcast another sci-fi podcaster was digitizing it uh um he digitizes he digitizes uh jesse from SFF audio, he digitizes old amazing stories and things like all the time. And he happened to digitize a amazing stories from 1948 that had a letter from Phil. And so he tweeted to me like, Oh, have you seen this letter from Phil? And it had a return, it had an address on there. And we were just about to do the, the, the walking tour. And we hadn't found that one. Nobody had found that one before. And he only lived there, I think his freshman and sophomore year of high school mm. and uh but we got to talk to uh when we were standing there the neighbor that lived next door was taking his trash trash out <laughs> and uh he was like saying hi to us like what are you weirdos doing and we're like do you do you know who lives here and I'm like no oh he's like yeah they lived here for 25 years and like did you know that philip k dick lived here when he was a kid no way <laughs> you know and so we were able to let the people in the neighborhood know, like, hey, Phil slept here. Um, and only because just randomly Jesse was digitizing that episode, that issue. And I love that to kind of like weird discovery. So that that ghost story is going to be top of my list when, when that book comes out, because yeah, that's really neat. Now, um, let's get into your short stories. But before we get into the, the your most recent collection, you also have uh, Spine Tinglers, which is cool uh, project that you're doing. And um, I know most of these stories are older stories, but um, 
I, I am interested too if you think that doing this research on weird women is is going to really affect your, your 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 writing going forward. So that would be my last question about weird women, and then we'll get into spine tinglers. Like it, this is going to have to have a huge influence, right? Like just doing this research and reading these the, these women that you hadn't read before or, or discovered. Like it's yeah, a bit. Um, yeah. I don't know that I would say it was a huge influence. Um, I. I I, if anything, it made me feel more comfortable with my work because I feel like I'm part of this history that I didn't really know about before. So um, uh, that would probably be the biggest influence I think that that it's it's had for me. Oh yeah, that's cool. Now, so what's the story with spine tinglers? Where did where um, where did the, where did this uh, originate? Spine tinglers was. Um, sort of sprang out of me doing the little weekly ghost reports on this podcast ghost magnet with Bridget Marquardt and um, the producers of that said um, it turns out I'm I, this is this is very weird to me to even say this I'm popular on the ghost magnet podcast <laughs> um, like I said which is very weird for me and um, people liked it enough that they said maybe we should spin you off onto something and I said well I like to do an original fiction podcast and um i will actually write little tiny short stories new stories for this every week um which i know is crazy but the stories are only like a thousand to fifteen hundred words long um and they don't take me that long to write truthfully um and the, there was there's one little problem it's kind of the show's a little bit on hiatus right now truthfully we because their idea for doing the show the producers was to have each story read by a quote-unquote celebrity reader and I kind of felt right from the start like that was a mistake mm -hmm. um, because I can write faster than they could find celebrity readers <laughs> and that is indeed what has happened i've written 35 of them they have recorded 11. Um, <laughs> so i'm not sure where spine tinglers is bound at this point um i have enough that i that we are talking about actually publishing a collection of them oh so, that would be cool that would be cool. Yeah. I mean, there are things that have never been, like I said, I wrote them all just for this podcast. So they're not things that have been published before. And um, so that might be fun, but we'll see. I, I don't know. I, I think we're kind of trying to rejigger the whole thing right now. Yeah. You know, what's, what's cool too is, um, and I had this experience just uh, uh, talking to you when, when I was at the Iliad a few weeks ago, and um, it, it's, I, I also often, you know, it's that whole thing of where you put people in your boxes and, and I thought, you know, well, Lisa's really knowledgeable about horror, but what was cool is when we got to talking, I realized you've read a lot of classic science fiction as well, you know, and, and, and that stuff. And um, so what's cool is that that was a good reminder for me, but I also got that in reading Night Terrors because as we'll get to some of the stories. And I know you said you told me personally that you feel a little intimidated writing science fiction, but I actually loved the more science fiction-y stories in this collection. But let's transition to uh, Night Terrors. And um, this is uh, up for the YouTube listener or viewers. I've uh, got my recent dog-eared and um, a well-loved copy of Night Terrors and Other Tales, which is your most recent like full collection, right? So you have a couple short story collections. I know I've got Monsters of L.A. and um, I, I have I, I know I pretty sure I have another one. But um, and and listen, I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of your novels. I think uh, Castle of Los Angeles is um, is a really underrated ghost story, which, you know, so if people want to hear you or want to read you doing a ghost story, I think Castle of Los Angeles is a great place to start. Great book. Um but here, um, Night Terrors, it, it kind of, um, it, it, it's 20 stories, which is a lot, right? It's, it's, a, it's a very, it's, it's, um, but it's broken up into monsters, psych ward, mad science, 
Bad Magic and the Unnameable. Like, um, was that something that you set out to do before you started compiling the stories? Or did you compile the stories and then realize you had these sections and then moved them around? Yeah, it's choice B. I um, Because I chose the stories to go into this collection. And this actually is my first sort of greatest hit style collection. Um, I've had two other major collections published. One, as you mentioned, was Monsters of LA. And that was all original stuff um, that was kind of themed together. And then I had a collection published of Halloween fiction called The Shamanach and Other Halloween Treats. Yes, I have that one as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there were a couple of like smaller things. But uh, my first sort of major retrospective collection is Night Tears and Other Tales. And That's true. Um, the, the other two both have themes. Right, right? exactly. Yeah, and, my two short story collections have themes as well. So okay, it's right. kind of yeah. that way. Yeah. Yeah. And with Night Terrors, as I was pulling the stories that I really liked and wanted to see go into the book, I started to see sort of thematic similarities between little bunches of them. So that was why I ended up thinking, hey, it'd be fun to gather these into little subsections. And, um, and then I chose those little crazy section titles. And, and we'll, we'll break down some of those a little bit more. But let's talk about your influences with short story writing. Um, I've been on record as saying that you're you're one of my favorite short story writers, um, working uh, modern short story uh, writers. And um, I, I'll go out on a limb and, and say that I think you're up there with the Ligatis, the Evansons, the, you know, in, in my opinion, I think Cody and John Shirley are up there as well as some of my personal favorite um, Cody Goodfellow and John Shirley is some of my personal favorite short story writers. And um, I know because I, cause we've talked before, but it's also in the dedication of this book that, Den that Dennis, Dennis Etchison, um, you know, play, played a role in, in not just influencing your work, but actually being, being a teacher. And listen, um, uh, I, I think I uh, was the one that commissioned Dennis for one of his last public appearances at Horrible Imaginings. And Dennis and his work means a lot to me. Um, uh, and I knew, I know he had a real gruff personality that, that was rough for some people. <laughs> uh, but I thought Dennis was a sweetheart and a wonderful, um, but just as an art, he was just an amazing short story writer now i like some of the novels that he wrote but his short stories were just he was just wired to to write a horror short story uh, yeah. can you tell me about dennis's influence on you yes dennis yeah um i first read dennis in the early 80s i think it was probably about 81 or 82 and i actually knew him before i read him um, I met him through a mutual friend, and I thought he was an interesting guy, and I said to my, my friend, hey, do you have his book? I want to read his book, and uh, that book was The Dark Country, um, the story, sort of seminal story collection, and those stories just absolutely rocked my world. I mean, they were, I think at that point, I hadn't put a lot of thought yet into the idea of writing prose fiction. I was focused on screenwriting. That was what I had studied in college and kind of what I wanted to do. And reading those stories was like, oh my God, this is kind of the way my head works. I think I could almost write short stories if they're like this. Um, and I still didn't write prose through most of the 80s. It wasn't until I actually had a tiny modicum of success as a screenwriter that I realized I wanted to write prose um, because I didn't find out I didn't really like being a screenwriter. And, right. um, and Dennis was a friend all along. He was always there. We were both in LA, so we were both at just a lot of the same events and, and running into each other all the time. And um, he was always kind of there urging me to try these new things and uh, reading the things that I wrote. And um, he bought one of my favorite stories from me for a book that he edited called The Museum of Horrors. And when I did Castle of Los Angeles, and, you know, you're always supposed to get blurbs for these things, I, I sent him 
the book to read for a blurb and he sent me back a two page long blurb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> two pages. Two pages, which was incredible. I mean, obviously we ended up just using a tiny chunk of that, but uh, and um, I knew him all the way up through his life. He was kind of always a, a, an important figure for me and I adored him and um, in fact, I will share something here that this was one of Dennis's favorite mugs that I have on my desk now, just to sort of keep awesome. me. Yeah. When he passed away, his widow asked me if there was anything of his that I would like to have. And I said, I want something simple that he kept on his desk that, you know, just that he used. So I have one of his favorite mugs there. Um, so yeah, he was, it, both his work and he, him as a person were, were hugely influential in getting me into writing short stories. Oh, yeah. Well, and, you know, it, it's one of those things that um, with him, his short stories were, uh, they were powerful and they stuck with you and, and they were, you know, like... Um, and if you, and if you got to know him, you could, you could, um, he's one of those writers where you could start to like, kind of sense his personality in a really interesting way too, when, when, when you'd read it in the future. Yeah. 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 And, um, all right. So, uh, but this, this collection, um, you know, you said it, it's more kind of retrospective. Let's talk about the stories in the, in the monsters section. Um, uh, was there a particular reason why you launched with monsters? Um, that's a good question, and I, I don't know that I have an answer for it. I don't know. I think I kind of wanted to put the story tested near the front because that was um, one that generated a lot of buzz for me. It ended up winning the Bram Stoker Award for short fiction. And so I thought it was kind of an, an important one to put near the front. And, and because it is a monster story, I think that's probably why that section ended up there. No, that was a cemetery dance story, right? It was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I and, and I know that because I, I, it was the one that I remembered. I remembered reading that in cemetery dance when it came out. So um, a couple of the stories were ones that I had read along the way in various things, like your Dark Delicacy story, for example. And, um, and it, it's funny with uh, Dark Delicacy, uh, Black Mill Cove, when I got to that story, I had the thought to myself, well, I can skip that one. I've read it before. And then I ended up reading it again anyway. So <laughs> it's like, um, and uh it, it was great because too that I had this experience where I thought I remembered the story and then of course you know it was years ago that I read it so I was you know of course had a totally different experience reading it and it was that was a good reminder like I often skip stories I've read before in collections and um, Black Mill Cove will have the effect on me that I'm not skipping those stories again so yeah um, <laughs> well Intested was one that when I, I didn't realize because I didn't look to see where where it came from and i got to reading it and i was like oh i've read this one before this one's really good um so what's the what's the story with tested i mean like it won the bram stoker award but where do you remember where the genesis of the story was yeah i do it, it was one of those things that kind of came from working at the iliad um because i was seeing a lot of copies of this book come through the store called the greatest generation and I kind of picked it up and flipped through it. And I kind of thought it was bullshit, truthfully. <laughs> um, I didn't like the fact that it seemed like a lot of what was defining something as the greatest generation was their participation in a war. Um, right. You know, I, I, I personally, for me, I would find the generation of the 60s far more admirable for the commitment to civil rights and actually changing things. And um, so I kind of wanted to write a story that was a response to that, that addressed this idea that, you know, maybe your ability to be in a war is not what should make you great. Um, and so that's really what's at the heart of that story. 
Well, and you've, you've, you've touched on something, too, that is one of the reasons why uh, you're one of my favorite short story writers, which is, and, it, and anybody who knows me knows, I mean, I've got my John Shirley books right here. John Shirley is one of my favorite writers, and he's really well known for being outspoken, and, and you, you have a lot of authors like, um, you know, like Michael Moorcock and different people that have been, or Norman Spinrad or Ursula Le Guin that are known for being politically outspoken, but um, th there's a definite point of view in these stories uh throughout and th there's a there's a a lot of um uh rightfully angry <laughs> takes it, it, in this book and um you know i lisa i think you're every bit as political as as, as john or um you know a, a, a Le Guin in, in your short stories. I think they're, they're very political and that one's an example. Um, you know, and of course, you know, uh, sparks fly upward, which is also, which is the zombie story, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, I mean, you have a story in the section called, um, you know, blood for the American people. <laughs> you're not, you're not hiding the fact that you've got a point of view here. Um, yeah. so that that's intentional, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, I, um, I had this, this thing I talk about it fairly often, which is this idea that, oh, no, writers should never include politics in their work. Oh, no, 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 it becomes, I've heard these things like, oh, no, it just becomes preachy or pedantic. And my, my answer to that is always, sure, if you're a bad writer, <laughs> if, right. if you are a good writer, and you feel serious passion about something why not why wouldn't that be in your work and and these are things i'm passionate about and um i am happy to express them in my work i think that to me that should be part of an artist's work and um i treasure every piece of hate mail i've ever gotten on them too <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh john has uh, some really hilarious amazon reviews for his batman novel where batman fights a white supremacist a white supremacist <laughs> You know, and and you could tell a lot of Batman fans had a problem with that, <laughs> right? And uh, um, it's funny how that's some of the most intense stuff he's yeah. ever gotten. And all the political stuff he's written was writing that Batman novel. Um, all right, so um, yeah, so probably the most political or the most interesting for me, political, somewhat science fiction e kind of. Um, and it was in your in uh, John Skip's Mondo Zombie, which is uh, Sparks Fly Upward, uh, taking a very um, intense uh, political stance on the issue of abortion in a zombie story. Um, that was that was a curious one. So did you um, did you discuss that idea with Skip before you sent it to him for Mondo Zombie, or is it just one you were like, hey, um, uh, check this out, or did you just send it in cold to him? No, I sent it in cold. And in fact, I begged him to read that story because I really, really, I loved Book of the Dead, which was the mm -hmm. first of his zombie anthologies that he co-edited with Craig Spector. And, and I loved Still Dead, the follow-up. And I really, really wanted to be in one of those books. And um, I knew he wasn't, I don't think he was reading unsolicited submissions for the third one, but I said, would you consider reading a story for me? And he said, sure. Um, and so I sent him that and he liked it so much. He actually called me and left. It was great. I wasn't even at home, I think. And I get home and there's this message on my answering machine from John Skip raving about this story. And um, it was a very long message. I should have kept that, darn it. But um, anyway, so yes, it was, um, he didn't know what he was getting and I'm really happy that he loved it. So, yeah. And I'm sure that story, uh, uh, sparked some outrage from, from, uh, people who needed to get over it. Right. Um, <laughs> well, so for, for people who don't know, and, and I'm gonna, I'm not going to completely spoil this, but I, these stories, but, um, it's definitely a, a, a takes a stance and, um, kind of, um, solves an issue with abortion. You know what I thought of that story is that story really reminded me in a, a really interesting way of um, 
Alice Sheldon, aka James Tiptree Jr.'s work, like the, um, like I got a Tiptree feel from from that story. Um, and I was surprised when I was looking back over the review that I wrote for for this book that I didn't mention that because um, I remember reading that story and just thinking I I think I even wrote because I always take a couple bit a couple notes when I'm reading a book and I remember I I had written Tiptree down when I read that story and um, I just recently reread a tip tree collection. So, um, so it's fresh in my mind. So, but, um, but yeah, definitely on that one. So uh, uh, the psych ward, uh, (laughs) uh, these, these are some more of the, obviously the psychological stories in there and um, a black milk coat, which I already mentioned was in, um, uh, Dell's uh, Dark Delicacies anthology. Uh, I think the first one, right? It was uh-huh. the, yeah. yeah, it was in the first one, and uh, that's a, a great story. That was cool because you got to be that collection. You got to be alongside Clive Barker and a, a whole bunch of a, a really great names. So, um, tell me about the inspiration for Black Milk Cove. That's that's a really good one. The, the, what's funny about that is that I've had people come up to me and say, you know, I, I, I liked the second half of that story, but the, the, I had a problem with the first half because I didn't believe any of it. And my answer to that is I actually did everything in that first half of that story. <laughs> this was one of the insane hunting trips with my dad. Um, we, yes, he, he really did drag me on this thing where we parked at a cliff edge at 4.30 in the morning, walked like three miles along the top of a cliff in pitch black night. You can barely see anything. You can hear the ocean roaring below you. Climbed down a cliff, (laughs) like 60 feet. Um, and then he had on a wetsuit and I sat on a rock while he dove into the tide pools in search of abalone which is the story centers around an alone abalone hunter so the only difference between me and the guy in the story is that i was with dad i was not alone and i didn't i didn't actually do the abalone hunting i i set up and took pictures and um watched and got too much brine in my eyes and my eyes were stinging and um but dad got his limit of abalone and uh, the tide was out. You have to do this during a low tide. And there really were sharks um, around. I mean, I found that a little scary. And, um, and uh, you know, it's one of those things where as you're sitting there waiting for your dad to finish this insane thing, you're, you're thinking, wow, you know, what if you found really a horrible things out here too? <laughs> so. Right, right. So it's funny that people didn't believe that, that was yeah. the thing. Um, now the, my favorite section of it and just being a science fiction guy, of course, I love the mad science part. Um, and, um, the ultimate Halloween party app was, was that already in your, your Halloween collection or is, is that a newer, it must be a newer story considering yeah. the technology. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, what's, what's, um, obviously you probably get, um, uh, I have tons of Halloween ideas or things that come around Halloween, but um, I thought this story was kind of fun. I mean, I thought it was a little funny too. Um, and you definitely need the more lighthearted stories every once in a while, especially considering the story that comes after it, um, which is funny as well, but different. Well, we'll get to resurrection policy in, in a bit. Um, but uh, the, the ultimate Halloween party app, where did that come from? Um. My longtime editor friend, Steve Jones, invited me into a book he was doing called The Mammoth Book of Halloween Stories. And this was, this, as you mentioned, this is a newer story. This was just a couple of years ago that he did this book. And when he invited me into this book, I started thinking that I wanted to make sure I did a Halloween story that would be like nothing else in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I decided it would be set in the near future, that it would have a science fiction edge, that that would certainly probably distinguish it. But because Steve is a a very dear friend and he and I share a mutual love for old monster movies, especially the universal classics, I I wanted to put that into it. 
Um, so I kind of melded those two ideas into this this story, which ends up becoming about this this app that is used at a party to, to convince you that you are seeing virtual you're seeing virtual images of classic monsters, but the app convinces you that they're real. Mm. Yeah, it, it's a good one. Now, the probably my two favorite stories in the collection were the next two, which is uh, Resurrection Policy, which is has a for me it has a very philip k dick feel to it uh dickian thing with um you know he used i mean he generally wrote more uh working class characters and this this book this this story is a about a rich guy who kind of pays for a, a resurrection but didn't read the fine print which was great and um and one of the things that's underrated for Philip K. Dick is his humor, that he was a hilarious writer. And what I like about this story, it's a very darkly funny story about this guy who didn't read the fine print and ends up resurrected in a body that he did not want um, with this technology. What's the inspiration for this one? There may be a little Dick influence in that, but um, I, there was also... Uh, a series, I'm trying to remember if it was a series of stories or there were some things that the writer John Varley had written that I always liked. Um, there was a lot of Varley's early stuff I really liked. And there was a story that was, um, I think it was called something like a, a Phantom in Kansas about this idea that you, your memories could be stored on a um, computer media and transferred into a body and, um, I just immediately saw a lot of potential for that to go terribly wrong. <laughs> right. um, as, we'll talk about we, seance too, because, yeah. you know, I, I, I mean, that's, that could be your, your near future seances, you know, where the medians, well, okay, oh, oh, I'm giving away an idea here, Lisa, I, I gotta stop here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so the, this idea that this guy was trapped on this hard drive is is pretty frightening concept, and then the execution of like where he ends up, it balances the humor and, and the scary stuff. A plus story for me, um, and I don't think you can. I, I mean, I, I'm kind of giving it away, but I think <laughs> I think this is one that can't be ruined because it because it was really in the execution, and I thought it was really well done. Now the next story, feel the noise. Um, I, I love this story. This is definitely a little bit more of a vibe story. Um, what's, what's the deal with this one? <laughs> this is a very funny, strange Genesis. Um, this story is a tribute to a, um, lifelong friend who is actually <laughs> the illegitimate offspring of the lead singer of Quiet Riot. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Um, and I always said, I'm going to write you a story for dear old dad one of these days and um, who he never met. I mean, never met Kevin Dubrow. And um, I think he looks very much like him. He will deny that. But anyways, uh, so I said, I'll write you a story one of these days about that, which is where the, the title comes from. Quiet Ride's big hit being, of course, Feel the Noise. And um, the uh, story was written for, originally it was for a themed anthology about um, uh, like metal, 80s metal, and then that anthology didn't happen. Um, and I'm not sure the whole sort of synesthesia idea in it. I don't actually remember why I went with that, um, but that I, it might have been something I was reading about what veterans returning from the Iraqi war were experiencing. There was a little bit of that that was definitely in there, I think. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, I definitely think the combined elements of that story, uh, it, it really worked. And for me, it was just one of that um, when it was over, like I, I just, I, I just definitely, I remember noting that this was a story that really worked for me, that it just, um, and I, I'm not even quite sure I wrote much about it in my review, but I just feel like it's a story that just worked really, really well. Um, I was very into it. Now, 
bad magic. Now, it seems like a lot of that section would be influenced by the ghosts and the medium and the seance research. Um, did some of these stories come from that era or some of them older? I think they're pretty much all older stories in that section. Um, the seance book only came out two years ago. Um, so by the time I was, and this book actually was in preparation way back in like 2019. So I don't think there's anything in here that would be inspired by the Sands book because it would be too new. Um, but yeah, some of the uh, stories in there, I, my, my favorite story in that section is actually one called The True Worth of Orthography, which was in a really tiny little um, sort of micro press anthology. So I don't think many people saw it, but I've always been interested in the idea that I think writing the actual physical act of writing and then handing that to someone to read is an act of magic because you are transmitting your thoughts to someone else without speaking. And I just, I find that just that to me, that's the definition of magic. Mm -hmm. Well, I recently, I know I wrote in a review and I, I, of a book where I was talking about the message of a book. And I said, you know, to me, that's the wavelength coming from the author's fingers or from the author's brain through their fingers to my eyeballs and to my heart. That's what I got out of it. And um, I, I was funny because after I, I wrote that, I was like, I wonder if I wasted that concept on a random book review. <laughs> 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 because I think that that, I, I think what you're talking about, yeah, and, and that story is, is great for that, is is talking about that magic transfer of, of ideas, you know? Just because you take any one of these stories and think about, you know, any writer knows that there's that moment where you're sitting there and you have the creation and, and it's it's cool to find out later when somebody's like, hey, that story connected with me or, or whatever. But yeah, no, uh, that's, a, that, that's a great one. And, and um, uh, so for the unnameable section, uh, these are the more kind of Lovecraftian stories and the ones that have like more of a, a cosmic bent. Um, and I think for me, um, it's interesting because Trigger Fate is the one from that section that I, I felt was um, because it's not it, that one's not very traditionally Lovecraftian, but the cosmic feeling of the 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 horror of this thing that has become normal in our country with mass shootings and those kinds of things um, uh like I, I got the wavelength you were putting down there as far as of just like what a cosmic scale it's almost becoming like how much this death has become ritualized in our culture today so um am i on the right track with that story because yeah absolutely yeah. and and also the i mean i think my first consideration about that i wanted to address is as you're putting it ritualized thing with mass shootings that they happen so much to us now that we just kind of go oh, another one you know you see the news in the morning and you go oh great another mass shooting at another high school or another store or another theater and um i think what we sometimes miss and i mean you have to you have to react that way after a while but what you don't think about is the lives of the people who just lost them these, these ridiculous horrible random things and um so i wanted to talk about the the road not taken in essence with that yeah 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 it's it's um i i think it's one of the more powerful stories uh in the book um so um why why uh night terrors for for, for uh the title story here at the at the very end the, the, the story behind that story is that um, uh, I knew I wanted a new story to um, close the anthology with or uh, the collection with. And um, that story sprang from me being uh, getting out of bed one morning and my partner Ricky said, you screamed in your sleep last night. And I'm like, what? No, I didn't. He said, yeah, you did. You woke me up. And I mean, he's hard of hearing. So if he says I screamed, I know I screamed. And 
I had no memory of this whatsoever. I have absolutely no idea why that would have happened. Um, and that was really chilling to me that, that I could have done this thing that I had absolutely no memory of. Um, so that was the genesis of that particular story. Mm, yeah, well, it's a powerful one. Now, did I miss any any of the stories that are personal favorites of yours from this collection? Um, I know, uh, you know, uh, authors sometimes have their favorite their favorite children um, in this regard. Um, so these are a lot of these are the ones that impacted me. I know one of the ones from that last section, the secret engravings, I thought was very powerful. Um, but it, what's funny for me in that is is that um, I'm very over Lovecraftian stories. So like when I came into this section i i was kind of i admit i was not as excited as some of the other sections but uh secret engravings was a story that worked really really well for me and um and i of course i have to be reminded that i'm going to like lovecraftian stories if they're written by writers i like it's just <laughs> right. uh, you know um i mean john Shirley just put out lovecraft alive a couple of years ago did a whole collection of them and I loved every stinking page of that too. So, you know, even though I'm, I'm over Lovecraft stuff a bit, but, um, but anyways, any, uh, secret favorite children from anywhere in this book, any of this. Yeah. The, the one I would have to mention is pound rots and fragrant Harbor, um, which is a story that Dennis bought. So it already has meaning to me because of that, but it also was directly inspired by my trip to Hong Kong to interview Choi Hawk. Um, and yep. I wanted to write about that fabulous thing in that was Hong Kong at the time. And I, I haven't been back since. This was like 2000, 2001 when I went there. And I fear it probably has changed a lot. But back then, it was this incredible place that was an amazing mix of East and West. Um, I mean, you, it was like three or four years after the handover when um, Great Britain gave it, essentially gave it back to the Chinese. So there was still all kinds of British influence there. And then there was, of course, the Chinese influence. And you see that in the cinema so much. Um, the cinema, I think one of the reasons that it appeals so much to me is you see these odd Western things combining with the Eastern things. And so that was really a story where I wanted to talk about that. Um, and so between the, the trip that it came out of and Dennis buying it and, um, Dennis used to come up to me whenever he saw me for the year after the Museum of Horrors came out, the one thing he said to me every time was, so what awards has it been nominated for? And it was like, <laughs> that's, I, the fact that it had not been nominated for any awards didn't matter. What mattered was Dennis Edges and asking me that. I mean, you cannot get a better award than that. So, yeah, that's pretty meaningful too. Um, yeah, I uh, well, you know, I'm insanely jealous of your Hong Kong trip just for the fact that time and you watched uh, Troy Hark at a time and tide, which is one of my favorite um, action movies of the late. I guess it's the 2000 is when it yeah. came out, so I can't even call it a 90s, but. Um, yeah. But man, I love Time and Tide. Um, so uh, that was the first Troy Hark movie I was able to see in the theater. So um, nice. it played in the theater in Indianapolis. Um, wow. I, yeah, and uh, the theater that did it did um, did um, revival screenings um, alongside it of um, Once Upon a Time in China one and two. So when I say Time and Tide was first, it's because I stayed and and one night saw Time and Tide, Once Upon a Time in China one and two in the theater in one awesome. night. So yeah, that, that was a great night. For <laughs> sure, um, that's great. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Lisa, it was awesome talking to you about this book. Um, I, uh, I had a really fun time reading it um you know i'm a huge fan of your work will always be a big supporter um i think your short stories are i i, I think you are one of those writers that is so finely calibrated for the short story um in such a such a wonderful way 
It's not that I don't like your other work. I just think uh, your short stories, I think you're so, so damn good at the short stories. And one of the things I like is I love the constant point of view and that uh, you're not afraid to um, have an opinion and put it in there, of course, is always something I enjoy in horror fiction. So um, tell the folks who've made it this far uh, how they can find your work. Uh, how they can keep up with you. It sounds like you're making weekly appearances on podcasts. That means I have a new podcast I have to start listening to now that I know that. Um, uh, where can folks find you? Um, the easiest thing is just go to lisamorton.com and from there you will see right on the front page links to all of my social media and my upcoming or new books and um, I would also suggest people sign up for my author newsletter, which I put out around the first of every month, and it includes all kinds of news, and I try to make it fun, so there's little columns about things I think are interesting, and um, that's that. And thank you so much for all of the kind words, by the way. Um, I agree with you. I think I'm... I think I'm a better short story writer than I am a novelist, and that's... I always, I don't know, it's, people are always asking me when I'll write another novel, and at this point, I don't know if that will ever happen or not, but I love writing short stories. I'm very happy to keep Well, them. I don't want you to not write another novel, because I'm also a fan of Castle of Los Angeles, and so, like, I, I'm not, you know, I like your novels. I just think, I think you are so good at the short stories. I mean, yeah. look, Brian Evanson is one of my absolute favorite writers, and he's a He's a great novelist too, but that guy and short stories are just, you know, magic. And yeah. some yeah. writers are just that way. Harlan Ellison and, you know, and then you never know too. You have like Walter Miller, Miller Jr. who wrote lots of science fiction short stories, wrote one novel. <laughs> right. Canical for Leibowitz <laughs> was amazing and never wrote another one. It's, you just never know. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Lisa, it was fantastic talking to you and catching up. I hope people will find your other work. We'll have you back for Weird Women at some point. Um, and so that's also a, a good tease to people to go read Weird Women so you can be in it with us uh, when we do that. And um, uh, we'll definitely, I'm looking forward to that one. And uh, is the second Weird Women out? Because I've, 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 uh, I've already put a hold on it at the library, the first volume. So I didn't see the second one. So I might have to buy it if my library doesn't get it right you away. Can see, whoops, this little, this little pink pile of stuff over to my side, there is a, a stack of weird women too. It came out last year. So. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I was very aware of, of the first one. I just didn't know the second one came out already. Uh, um, and how far years does the, does volume two go to? It goes into the, 20s and 30s it goes up to 1925 um oh, okay. our 19- which, you know why i'm saying good because that means i think there's more years to, to cover eventually which sounds like fun for you and you and less so yeah <laughs> all we, right um, 1925 story by the way is zora neil hurston and it's a, an awesome people may not know she wrote ghost stories it's great it's called spunk really happy to close the book with that one so neat all yeah. right well uh, we'll be back for Weird Women, and um, Lisa, it was great talking to you, and uh, keep up the fantastic work. You know, in your bio and all the things that I mentioned, I didn't mention that you were president of the HWA for years, and uh, <laughs> like all the accolades, I can't even keep them all straight. Like, you've done so many awesome things. It's so great. Um, and thank you for all you did for the horror community for all those years, so... All right, uh, folks, uh, that's Lisa Morton. Definitely read her work. And I'll see you next time on Postcards from a Dying World. Thanks. Bye-bye.